Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, welcome to our show tonight. With its theme of sacrificing itself for one's country, uh, be an appropriate introduction for tonight's tribute to veterans. Uh, the date, of course, uh, originally recognized throughout the world as Armistice Day, established to celebrate the ending of the First World War uh, at the eleventh hour of the eleventh day in the eleventh month, exactly one hundred years ago. Uh, my intent this evening is not to uh, defend or glorify the practice of war, but rather to attempt through poems, many of them famous and written over a hundred years ago, to give varying impressions of what it was to be uh, a member of the armed forces. Uh, please note that some of our selections are not for the faint of heart, uh, will contain graphic, uh, even coarse uh, and potentially politically incorrect uh, language. Well, let me do. Let me just do a. a a uh, quick one of my own here. It's called Memorial Day. And I was, I'd, I'd come into work uh, early on Memorial Day, and I thought, oh, I'm not going to go sit down with all the crazies and fight the traffic on the bridge. I pulled off and went down, and uh, here I'm in this abandoned bar on the, on the, on the, right on the water, sitting out over the water. And I see an empty five gallon pail there, so I'm sitting down in the pail, and I'm watching, I'm watching the jet skis and the light. And then I'm thinking, why are all these people here? The only reason they're off on a Monday is because of, of it's Memorial Day. So this, what, these are my thoughts on that. Looking, not seeing, sensing without thought, pausing to reflect, watching boats go by, turning up the chop, fracturing the light, not much thought given, those beneath the sod, grouped by year and day, all those eager souls, torn from out the sky, drowned in lonely seas, pierced by burning lead, falling then in fear, knowing life bled out. Memorial Day. So that's, uh, that's incidentally in my, my first collection. Thanks, folks. My first collection of stuff gleefully entitled, I'm sober, but there's still hope. <laughs> Narrative verse with an attitude. Rudyard Kipling did one of his poems, Tommy, and um, I, I, I'm doing this because last month the U.S. marked the 17th consecutive year it has undertaken military operations in Afghanistan. Following the September 11th attacks, the U.S. began Operation Enduring Freedom in October of 2001 to prevent the expansion of a home base for the Taliban. Since 2015, a renewed campaign has been christened Operation Freedom Sentinel. At various times during the past 17 years, the combined U.S. and NATO forces operating in Afghanistan has exceeded 140,000 troops. The difficulty of these campaigns, at least in my mind, was highlighted last month when the theater commander for the U.S. and NATO forces, General Austin Miller, while meeting with pro-Western regional military leaders, was nearly assassinated by a teenage Taliban infiltrator. During this 10-second attack, three senior Afghan provincial leaders were killed and three American service members were wounded, one a brigadier general. The assailant was also killed. Well, recently reading this work, I'm going to quote some excerpts from uh, this 19th century fictional story, story about this region. I sensed that the author, Kipling, had a fair appreciation for the degree of the cultural divide between the West and the East and of the difficulties of attempting to, shall we say, harmonize that culture to Western norms. A similar effort, which was of course attempted uh, by the Soviets in the late 20th century and the Brits in the 19th century. So I'm going to share a few minutes uh, um, on uh, Kipling's assessment of, of this theater of operations, uh, particularly his comments after I get to the word bayonet. This is called Drums of the Fore and Aft. 
published in 1896 in a volume called Soldier's Tales. In the army list, they still stand as the four and fit Princess Hohenzollern Loyal Light Infantry Regimental District 329 Alpha. But the army, through all its barracks and canteens, knows them now as the fore and aft. They may in time do something that shall make their new title honorable, but at present they are bitterly ashamed. And the man who calls them fore and aft does so at the risk of the head which is on his shoulders. Their one excuse is that they came back again and did their best to finish the job in style, but for a time all their world knows that they were openly beaten, whipped, dumb cowed, shaking, and afraid. The men know it, their officers know it, the horse guards know it, and when the next war comes, the enemy will know it also. The courage of the British soldier is officially supposed to be above reproof, and as a general rule, it is so. The exceptions are decently shoveled out of sight, only to be referred to in unguarded talk that occasionally swamps the mess table at midnight. These are unpleasant stories to listen to, and the mess halls tell them under their breath, sitting by the big wood fires as some young officer bows his head and thinks to himself, please God, his men shall never behave unhandily. Now, the British soldier is not altogether to be blamed for occasional lapses. He wants to drink, he wants to enjoy himself, and in India, he wants to save money. And he does not, in the least, like getting hurt. He has received just sufficient education to make him understand half of the orders he receives. Thus, if he is told to deploy under fire, he knows that he runs a great risk of being killed and suspects that his life is being thrown away. Armed with imperfect knowledge, this young man is suddenly introduced to an enemy who in eastern lands is always unpleasant, is generally tall and hairy, and very frequently noisy. If our young troop looks to the right and then to the left and sees old soldiers, men of 12 years service who he knows know what they are about, he is consoled and applies his shoulder to the butt of his rifle with a stout heart. His peace is the greater if he hears a senior who has taught him his soldiering, whispering, they'll shout and carry on like this for five minutes, then they'll rush in and we've got them by the short hairs. But on the other hand, if he sees only men of his own term of service, turning white and playing with their triggers and saying, what the hell's up now? He becomes unhappy and grows acutely miserable. If he can be moved about a little and allowed to watch the effect of his own fire on the enemy, he feels merrier and may then be worked up to the blind passion of fighting. The rumor had gone abroad that the regiment was to be sent on active service. To take part in a war for the sake of brevity we will call the War of Lost Tribes. The barracks had the rumor almost before the mess room, and of all the 900 men in barracks, not 10 had seen a shot fired in anger. The regiment had been put by for many years. The overwhelming mass of its rank and file had from three to four years service, while the non-commissioned officers were under 30 years old. But they wanted to go to the front. They were enthusiastically anxious to go, but they had no knowledge of what war meant and there was none to tell them. The men had found food and rest in the army and now they were going to fight. They marched to the railway station, 960 strong, and every soul in the cantonment turned to see them go. And so they went northward, ever northward. Hurry up, you're wanted at the front badly, was the message that greeted the fore and aft. Arriving at their debarkation point, they began to march. At the end of their third day of marching, they were disagreeably surprised by the arrival in camp of a hammered iron slug, which fired from a steady rest at 700 yards, flicked out the brains of a private seated by the fire. This robbed them of their peace for the night and was the beginning of long-range firing carefully calculated to that end. Unfortunately, the regiment could not halt for reprisals. Its duty was to go forward. The Afghans knew this, 
and knew too, after their first tentative shots, that they were dealing with a raw regiment. Thus, at every march, the hidden enemy became bolder, and the regiment writhed and twisted under the attacks it could not avenge. The crowning Afghan triumph was the sudden night rush, ending in the cutting of many temp ropes, the collapse of the sodden canvas, and a glorious knifing of the British who struggled and kicked below. It was a great deed, neatly carried out, and it shook the already shaken nerves of the fore and aft. Upon the arrival of the fore and aft at headquarters, the brigadier arranged a battle. The enemy had been amassing an inconvenient strength among the hills, and the movement of many colorful flags warned him that the tribes had risen up in aid of the Afghan regular troops. The battle was to be a glorious battle. The three British regiments, after duly crowning the heights, were to converge from the center and the left and the right upon what we will call the Afghan army. The fore and aft, having enjoyed unbroken peace for five days, were beginning, in spite of dysentery, to recover their nerve. But they were not happy, for they did not know the work in hand, and had they known, would not have known how to do it. Death was a new and horrible thing to the sons of mechanics, who were only used to people dying decently of disease, and their careful conservation in barracks had done nothing to make them look upon death with any less dread. Very early in the dawn, the bugles began to blow, and the fore and aft, filled with misguided enthusiasm, turned out without waiting for a cup of coffee and a biscuit, and were subsequently rewarded by being kept under arms in the cold, while the other regiments leisurely prepared for the fray. The fore and aft awaited, leaning upon their rifles and listening to the protests of their empty stomachs. Their colonel did his best to remedy the default as soon as it was borne in upon him that the affair would not begin again at once, and so well did he succeed that the coffee was just ready when the men moved off, their band leading the way. Sounds like the military, doesn't it? Even then, there had been a mistake in time, and the fore and aft came out into the valley ten minutes before the proper hour. It was not a pleasant sight that opened upon the unobstructed view of the British, for the lower end of the valley appeared to be filled by an army in position, real and actual enemy regiments. The fore and aft continued to go forward, but now, with a somewhat shorter stride, they took open order instinctively, lying down and firing at random, rushing a few paces forward and lying down again, all done according to regulations. But once in this formation, each man felt himself desperately alone and edged towards his fellows for comfort's sake. Then the crack of his neighbor's rifle at his ear led him to fire as rapidly as he could, again for the sake of the comfort of the noise. The reward was not long delayed. Five volleys plunged the troop into bank smoke, impenetrable to the eye. Someone barked an order. Cease firing and let it drift away! A light wind drove the smoke to leeward, which revealed the enemy, still in possession and apparently unaffected. A quarter of a ton of lead had been buried a furlong in front of them, as the ragged earth attested. None of this was demoralizing to the Afghans, who have not European nerves. They were waiting for the mad riot to die down and were firing quietly into the heart of the smoke. A private of the fore and aft spun about in his company, shrieking with agony. Another was kicking the earth and gasping, and a third, ripped through the lower intestines by a jagged bullet, was calling aloud on his comrades to put him out of his pain. These were the casualties, and they were not soothing to hear or see. The smoke cleared to a dull gaze. Then the foe began to shout with a great shouting, and a mass of black mass detached itself from the main body and rolled over the ground at horrid speed. It was composed of perhaps 300 men who would shout and fire and slash, while a sim simultaneous rush of 50 of their comrades, each of whom was determined to die, was to sweep through the ranks of the British. The 50 were Ghazis half maddened with drugs and wholly mad with religious fanaticism. When they rushed, the British fire ceased, and in the lull, the order was given to close ranks and meet them with the bayonet. Anyone who knew the business could have told the fore and aft 
that the only way of dealing with a Ghazi rush is by volleys at long ranges. Because a man who means to die, who desires to die, who will gain heaven by dying, must, in nine cases out of ten, kill a man who has a lingering prejudice in favor of life if he can close with the latter. Where they should have closed and gone forward, the fore and aft opened out and skirmished, and where they should have opened out and fired, they closed and waited. A man dragged from his blankets, half awake and unfed, is never in a pleasant frame of mind. Nor does his happiness increase when he watches the whites of the eyes of 300 six-foot fiends, upon whose beards the foam is lying, upon whose tongues is a roar of wrath, and in whose hands are three-foot knives. I'm going to leave it there for you. It's easy to get on the internet. Try it. The drums of the fore and aft.